Good morning, everybody. I'm Stan Whittingham. I'm professor of chemistry and material science and director of the Battery Center here on campus. I came here in 1988. I came from industry, and I came here really to start a new research program in materials and also to bring my experience in industry to the classroom so I could, um, as I put it, teach students what they really need to no, I could tell them what they didn't need to know. <laughs> so um, many of us joined the campus at that time. Um, this campus looks for leaders in research who are also potentially great teachers. We have roughly, I think, 1,100 faculty on the campus now. And you're going to hear from just um, three of them today. And we have a great interviewer for them who I'm going to introduce now. She has picked up many, many awards. She's an attorney, a journalist, and a former White House aide. She was a Binghamton class of 86. So she knows the campus. She tells me she acted on this stage many times. Um, so let me introduce Jamie Floyd. She's going to be interview our three, um, I call them these days, younger faculty, who are the hot shots, who are going to really convince you where we're going. And I would ask you, as they come on stage, think about who it was that got you interested in the subject you're now studying professionally. It's probably a high school teacher or a faculty member on campus. So let me introduce Jamie Floyd. <laughs> Thank you. I can't remember ever having shared a stage with so eminent a presenter. Uh, I am so pleased to be back at Binghamton, um, where I came of age. I was impacted, my entire life was impacted by a professor I had here, a Dr. Edward Weisband, my entire worldview. Um, and uh, he taught me, I learned here, that learning is a lifelong process which is why I am so delighted to moderate this panel of esteemed faculty today. We are so fortunate to have with us this morning some of Binghamton University's brightest young stars on its faculty, Dr. Tracy Brooks, Dr. Elizabeth Deganji, and Dr. Nicholas Gaspelin. And you will meet them all in just a moment. But first, full disclosure, I am not a scientist. I love science as a kid, but with apologies to Dr. Whittingham, by the time I left Binghamton, chemistry, biology, the sciences were far in my rear view mirror. So when I was asked to moderate this panel, I worried that I was the wrong person to do it because I really know very little about the kind of innovative science that you are about to hear about, the research that these young faculty members are doing. Then I realized that it really makes a lot of sense for me to ask the same kinds of questions that many of you will have once they begin to talk about their important work. And then, of course, we're going to give you time to ask your own questions. So without further ado, let's bring out our first panelist, Dr. Tracy Brooks. Dr. Brooks is an associate professor in pharmaceutical sciences. She is the Menner Family Fellow, recognizing faculty of promise early in their careers. And her research focuses on oncology, anti-cancer therapeutics, and drug development based in DNA and protein interactions. Dr. Brooks, good morning. It's so good to see you again today. Good morning, Jamie. How are you? We had an opportunity to speak yesterday so I could learn just enough to ask some intelligent questions. <laughs> uh, and with that in mind, before we take a deeper dive, let's talk about uh, scientific literacy, a general question. How well do you think the public understands your field? And you know, given COVID and the last couple of years, it seems as though we've all had a bit of an education about pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical research, uh, and, and your field of study. But Really, have we? How much do we really understand? Give us a bit of context before we take a deeper of dive course. into your work. It'd be my pleasure. 
You know, in the last few years, I think we've all learned a bit more about science. You know, mRNA vaccines have been around for a decade or more, but until the last two years, nobody had ever heard the term, and now we all know what an mRNA vaccine is, at least to some degree. So the amount of scientific literacy has gone up in this pandemic, but there still seems to be a fear in the general public about scientific terms. Um, years ago, Penn and Teller did a, one of their specials where they kind of reveal things, and they got people to sign a petition to ban dihydrogen monoxide. But that's water. You know, you put water in scientific terms and it becomes a scary thing. So I think there's still this, this fear about any, it, it, it's one of my favorite things, it's DHMO. And there's this fear about anything in scientific terms as being not understandable, but it's just a different language. And every field has a different jargon, it has a different language, and you just have to be able to make use of terms that are, are more broadly known. Mm -hmm. And do you think we're getting there, that we are starting to be more open to learning what we need to do and to learn to be scientifically literate, or are we pushing back against that? or maybe a little of both? Maybe a little of both. I think, again, given the pandemic, everybody is a bit more interested in health and health sciences, and especially the vaccines. Um, and so there's a bit more deep diving into what all of this means, but there's still a fear when you put it in scientific terms because they are very difficult to understand, especially chemical terms. They are, mm. they are very prescriptive about what they are, but they are not easily translatable into other things like dihydrogen monoxide you would not think is water. <laughs> okay, with that uh, important context, let's talk about your work, which centers on oncology and anti-cancer therapeutics as well as, and I'm going to quote now so I don't get it wrong, okay. the development of new targets for drugs through a focus on DNA and the proteins that it controls. So let's break it down a little bit. Um, you're using DNA and the proteins that it controls. I think most people know a little something about both how cancer works and DNA, or at least we think we do, the Innocence Project, the O.J. Simpson trial, right? Um, but how do those two, <laughs> how do those things intersect Absolutely. DNA and, and, and cancer research? So DNA, just so everybody's on the same page, DNA, if you were a cook, DNA is essentially the recipe. If you're making bread, it gets turned into RNA, which is the dough, and that gets turned into the final product, which is bread. So it's a very great analogy. Um, but if you were to share a recipe with somebody, you couldn't give them the dough, you couldn't give them the bread, you actually have to give them the instructions. Right, so, so DNA is where the information is held. That being said, in cancer, DNA is where things go wrong. Fundamentally, it has to be a change in DNA in order for it to go from one generation of cells to the next, which is how cancer arises. It is cells gone crazy, not doing what they're supposed to, unruly teenagers in the room that just don't listen to anything you want them to do. So the cells are fundamentally changed at the DNA level, whether it's a mutation, it's some sort of change where the DNA, the, the recipe is no longer readable, the letters have changed, something has to be different. And that is absolutely what happens in the evolution of, D, of cancer. At the recipe level. At the recipe level, at the information transmission level. It's a great analogy. You. Uh, you have a video. I, I understand. do, I it do. demonstrates, I, I guess, is it about the ways in which the method of growing cells in the lab can affect the outcome it, it of does. your work? It so, does. So for a second before we play the video, I can tell you that so my, my research targets DNA as a means of kind of folding it into origami and oh, folding it into origami so you can't read it. Um, and so if, if the protein, if the bread is actually one of the main things that drives cancer, if you can make the recipe so you can't read it, you won't make that protein. Mm -hmm. So Got we're it. trying to study the DNA and targeting it with different drugs to fold the origami. And we study it in a test tube, and we study it in cells, and we study it in more complex systems. And where we study it in cells, you can see when the video starts to play in a second, the top two panels are kind of the traditional way of growing cells. They're grown in a flat petri dish, um, very two-dimensional, and that's very standard for the field. And we have colon cancer and breast cancer, just for examples on the screen. But we are not two-dimensional beings. You know, as much as I would like my volume to be a little bit less, realistically, <laughs> we are three dimensions. And so if we grow cancer cells in a three-dimensional form, you get all, a, a bit more of a representative of a human patient. And more importantly, you get problems with the drug entering this kind of three-dimensional shape. You get diffusion issues, and the chemo doesn't work as well, which is annoying in the laboratory, but matters more for the patient. Because if the chemo works in the lab, 
but not on the patient. It's irrelevant. Right. You need to be able to translate it, and so that's why we form these, these kind of three-dimensional structures. And you can see in breast cancer and colorectal cancer, they're fundamentally different structures that form because they're different parts of your body. And so we have to study each and every different type of cancer in these more complex forms. Which really makes me wonder how you came to this work in the first place. I mean, many different forms of cancer, kinds of cancer. Um, if you don't mind my asking. I don't mind at all. So tell us. Yep. So when I was a freshman in college, my grandmother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which is one of the cancers I study in lab. Um, it's one of the most, uh, has the highest mortality. And from, from diagnosis to when she passed away, it was only about two weeks. It was very short-lived. Mm -hmm. But that definitely changed the direction of, I, I knew I was a scientist, I knew I was interested, but that really moved me into the cancer field. And I went to a cancer center for graduate school and, and kind of went all cancer throughout. And when I was already an established scientist, my mother was diagnosed with late-stage endometrial cancer. Mm. And it really changed how I view when I became one of her primary caregivers. Um, and she lived for about, I think it was a year and a half, which was great, because her prognosis at first was three months. Wow. And she made it 21. Um, and the same year she passed away, my husband was diagnosed with metastatic testicular cancer. So it was just kind of this one after another. And I really became his caregiver as well. And those experiences, he's 10-year survivor. He's doing fine now. <laughs> Thank you. But it was definitely a difficult road at the time. But becoming the caregiver and seeing more of the patient side, not just the laboratory side, mm -hmm. has definitely expanded and kind of changed how I broach research and how I do everything in lab. Mm. Um, and often, some of the students that work in lab, um, if it's, they have personal connections to different type of cancers, we always try and connect them to what matters to them. Um, and I had a, a student who came in whose brother passed away from colorectal cancer, which actually wasn't one I had studied at the time, but that's how we got into colon cancers. It mattered to her to be able to impact something that had affected her brother. And so we expanded our, our field and, and kind of brought in colorectal cancer as well. Mm, thank you for that answer. Um, but then you led me to the next question, which is about students. Yes. Can you say, since we are at Binghamton yeah. University, can you, you say a bit more about your work with students, how they work with you, how you work with them, uh, and the role they play in your research? Yeah, I, I love working with students. I, I became a professor on purpose. I love interacting with people, explaining things, if you can't tell, in slightly different ways. Yeah. Um, and so we have students in the lab. I think at last count, we have 11 students in my laboratory right now, seven undergraduate and four pharmacy students, since I'm at the School of Pharmacy. And, and my laboratory has always worked with students at various levels. I've worked with high school students through some of the minority participation programs. I've worked with undergrads all the way through graduate students. And actually moving into this three dimensions of cancer cells was a student's idea. He came to me over a, a summer project and he had some kind of idea. He'd worked with it a little bit before. And so we, we made the jump and we started studying cells in this more complicated uh, um, a morphology, the um, way that the cells grow. Sorry, I'm trying to translate the words <laughs> as well. Um, and it's, it's just impacted our lab and how we study, whether it's a different type of cancer, a different way of studying cancer. Um, but I love interacting with students. It's one of my favorite things to do. And you impress me as someone who keeps up with your students over time, even after they leave your lab. I do, I do. Some of my um, closest friends are actually former students, a former graduate student um, from a different university that didn't happen. <laughs> <That's okay>. uh, <laughs> um, she's, she's one of my closest friends, and I love keeping in touch with all my former students. They're, they're wonderful people. It's long-term relationships. Well, I'm sure you're forming a lot of questions for Dr. Brooks. Hold them. We're going to bring out a couple of additional panelists. For now, I will say thank you, uh, Tracy. Yes. She said I could call her Tracy. Yes, please but do. But as you move <laughs> down the stage, please share with us your very special dedication to your field. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I have a, a fairly large DNA tattoo. I'm a little bit dedicated to the field of DNA. It travels down my leg. <laughs> I asked so her I, to dress I, a so DNA that she could show this to the from, audience. From the hair to the leg, I study <laughs> DNA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. <laughs> and next, I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Deganji. And I will confess to the audience that she and I bonded yesterday a bit over the fact that we are both native New Yorkers. Yay. Dr. Deganji is an associate professor of anthropology. 
She is a board certified forensic anthropologist. She's going to explain to us what that means in just a bit. Her expertise has taken her from studying the effect of diet on health in prehistoric times in the Andes to studying gunshot trauma and human rights violations. And she regularly consults on skeletal cases for local, state, and national agencies. We're gonna talk about all of that. Doctor, it's nice to see you again this morning. Thank you, Jamie. Good morning, how are you? I am well today. Great. I'm so pleased to be on this stage with all of you. Uh, that's a, a, quite a range of awards. So we're gonna try and walk through at okay. least some of it in just Great. a bit, just a few moments. Okay. Um, so let's, let's start with the question I asked Dr. Brooks toward the end. I'm gonna start with you. How did you find your way to this work? Because it's quite a range. Health in the prehistoric Andes to gunshot trauma and human rights violations. Let's start. Um, when you were a young person, how did you know you wanted to be an anthropologist, let alone a forensic anthropologist? Yeah, so I took a class in college and, and fell in love with, with anthropology. I initially wanted to go to medical school, and so I was taking biology classes, and um, a friend recommended that I consider taking anthropology because almost everybody who, or a large number of students who apply to medical school, are biology majors, and so just do something to set myself apart. So I took an introduction to cultural anthropology class, and it explained the world to me in a way that the world had never been explained before. And pretty much, I think, halfway through that semester, I declared my major as anthropology. And as soon as I learned that anthropology was a much broader discipline, and it didn't only include the study of human cultures, but it also included the study of bones and the study of human biology, mm -hmm. when I learned about the bones part, I thought, that is super cool, and, mm -hmm. and that's what, what I want to do. And so that's um, kind of how I found my way, and then I, applied to graduate school, and um, I did my, my undergrad and my, um, and my master's degrees at the University at Buffalo, so I am a SUNY alum, like everybody in our audience today, or most of the people in our audience today. And um, that, that pretty much was it for me. That was the path that I, that I chose, because I think bones are, are super cool, and um, <laughs> which they are. We all have them. <laughs> yes, we all have them, we do, we do. So, so you said bones twice in that answer, mm -hmm. and that makes me think of the show bones. Uh, and shows like CSI and Law and & Order and uh, Forensic Files, which was a show in the 90s, may still be on. And it, it, getting back to the idea of scientific literacy, people think they know what forensic anthropology is, but do we really? What is it? What, what yeah. do you do? Yeah, so that's a really great question. So actually, one of my colleagues was the creator of, of the show Bones. One oh. of my, uh, my colleagues who is a board-certified forensic anthropology is myself but um, forensic anthropologist, but um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not super accurate. And so what is, that's a really good Surprise. question. Surprise, right? It's, it's done up for, for television. So what is forensic anthropology? So anthropology is the study of what it means to be human. And that's big, that obviously, that, that's a tall order for a single discipline. And so what we do as anthropologists is we divide, we divide the discipline up into different parts. And my specific part of that, of what it means to be human, is the biological side of what what it means to be human, and my particular area within the biological side is the study of the human skeleton. So mm. um, the advanced study of the growth, anatomy, development of the human skeleton, as well as how the skeleton responds to things such as disease, how it responds to things such as, such as trauma. And so what forensic anthropologists do is we use that advanced knowledge of the skeleton and we apply it to um, contexts where um, law enforcement might be involved or where the criminal justice system might be involved. And so the, the traditional um, the traditional example that we usually give is somebody passes away in the woods and they're not found for some time and they become a skeleton. And in that sort of context, you can't do a traditional autopsy. Mm -hmm. And so they would call in somebody like myself to analyze that skeleton and be able to say something about who that person was, you know, how tall were they, um, were they male or female for adults. Um, how old they were when they died, was there any trauma on their skeleton, and so forth. But that's not the only context in which we work. So 
yes, we do have those, those isolated skeletal cases, but we're also involved when there might be a plane crash, for example, and so um, the forces that were exerted on people's bodies are extensive, and in that situation you can't do a traditional uh -huh, autopsy uh -huh. either, or situations where you might have something like a mass grave, where you have a number of people who have been, who have been interred and it's much more complex to try to get um, people identified. And so the forensic anthropologist will do the skeletal analysis, the analysis of, of all of those bones, um, and in some cases we're also involved with the actual recovery and excavation of, of the remains of the bodies as well. I asked you yesterday about 9-11 as an example, September yes. 11th, yes. the, uh, specifically at Ground Zero, but perhaps the other sites as well. Yes. That would be an example, would it not? Uh, absolutely, and in fact, my predecessor here at Binghamton University was one of the um, anthropologists who went down to, to Ground Zero um, in 2001. Um, and there are anthropologists um, at the New York City office of the, the medical examiner who continue to work hmm. um, on those remains because they, there remain people who have not um, been identified from hmm. that attack. So, so then let's take a deeper dive on your work or into your work um, with that context. Uh, and I want to talk about your important work in Colombia. Um, which, which led to the publication of a co-edited volume with Dr. Megan Moore entitled Research Methods in Human Skeletal Biology. That was published first in 2013, but it actually grew out of your five-year study as a teacher and advisor of forensic professionals in Colombia. Can you tell us about the work you did there? Yeah, of, of course. So I was a contractor for the US Department of Justice, and they have a special program which is in several countries around the world. And the, the purpose of that program is capacity building for law enforcement and for forensic professionals. And so in my specific role um, as part of that program in Columbia as a forensic anthropologist, it was to be a mentor for the forensic professionals. So specifically the forensic anthropologists, the forensic dentists, and the forensic doctors. So those people who are involved in the efforts for human identification in that country. Um, for those people who are unfamiliar, Colombia has a decades long um, crisis, um, conflict, um, estimates of the number of missing people, the, the largest estimate I've seen is 250,000 people um, missing in that country as a result of the very complex, um, very complex uh, context there. And so there are a lot of graves, there are a lot of unidentified bodies, people who need to be identified to be returned to, to their families, a lot of families who just don't know, you know what happened hmm. to their son or daughter or, or so forth. And so my uh, job has been, and I, I've con recently I've been doing some part-time consulting for that same program again in Columbia. Um, my job has been to work with my colleagues to um, help them increase their efficiency with the actual skeletal analysis, also with the skeletal excavation, the excavation of graves, but also to help them with their, um, with their lab protocols, and most importantly, to, to ensure that their skills and their knowledge are um, in line with, for skeletal analysis, are in line with international standards. Mm -hmm. so, so that everybody is kind of on the same level playing field with their, their skills and knowledge when it comes to skeletal analysis and when it comes to excavation and when it comes to human identification. I realize, and the same thing happened when I was speaking with you yesterday, uh, Tracy, that we were talking as professionals less than we were as human beings. You know, I'm an attorney, you're doctors, um, but now that we're sitting on the stage, I'm, you know, a especially at my, the place where I came of age, I'm much more in my human self. And I appreciated so much that you talked about your students and their connection as human beings to the work and your own personal reason for coming to the work. And so then, again, as a lawyer, I always think, uh, especially as a former criminal defense attorney, I'm always thinking about cases, but it's about the human beings. So as you talk about this identification of these remains, I started to think about why. It's not just about the science, right? Explain for us why it's so important in Colombia or anywhere else you do your work to make those identifications, right? For yeah. the families, for the victims, or even, you know, 
20 years after 9-11, why a family would want to know, would need to know? Uh, absolutely, I, I think that, that's, a, that's a great question. For me, that's a basic human right. To, to know what happened to your loved one and to be able to mourn your loved one and know where they are, to be able to know, okay, this, this is where my loved one has been placed, this is their final resting place. That For me, that's a basic human right. I would want to know where my brother was buried. I would want to know where my grandmother was buried. Um, that, that's, for me, that's my basic human right, and I think everyone um, deserves that. And there are so many contexts not only in Colombia, but in other places around the world here in the United States as well, where people just, that, that, that big question mark. And, and for me, that question mark is unacceptable, that you have to live your life with that question mark where you just don't know and that churning feeling of, of are they still alive? What could have happened? You know, the, all the horrible thoughts that might pass through, through, through people's heads. Um, that's just not, um, that's just not acceptable for me. And mm. so um, I think that was, um, that, that conviction was part of what drew me to, um, to be interested in this kind of work. Mm. Mm. And, and so then, Doctor, what have you learned over the years about the application of forensic anthropology to questions surrounding human rights violations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me, you know, that, that's a really great question, Jamie, and it's, um, it's, it's been an evolving understanding, I, I think, over, over the past 20 years or so that, that I've been involved in, in this kind of work. For me, the, the, the answer, it's, it goes beyond forensic anthropology and, and human rights specifically and, and that specific lesson and that very specific context. What I have learned is more generally that really no matter what you're interested in, um, if you are interested in the sciences, if you are interested in the arts, if you are interested in business, you can take that and figure out what the particular marriage might be between your own professional interests um, or personal interests and some issue of social justice that is important to you. And, and the reason that I have um, um, learned that and then I've, that I've come to think about it in this way is because what I do as a skeletal biologist is relatively esoteric. Um, there's maybe a couple thousand people in the world, 3,000, maybe 4,000 people in the entire world who study the human skeleton for similar reasons that I study the human skeleton. There aren't that many of us. Yet, I've been able to take that intellectual and academic interest in the fact that bones are really cool, as I mentioned before, and figure out how to apply that to, um, to social justice issues that are important to me as a global citizen. And so that's the, the lesson that I try to impart with my students, that you may not go into forensic anthropology specifically, a lot of them want to because you know, they see it as, as romantic and, and interesting and so forth. Um, you may not go into this very specific field, but no matter what you go into, there is a way to be creative and think about how you can find that particular marriage between the things that you are interested in, the things that you are passionate about intellectually um, and, and personally, and, and marry that with some human rights issue or some social justice issue as well. As Dr. Brooks did, you just gave me the uh, lead to the question about students. So can you say a few words about your work with your students? Yeah, uh, of course. My, my students are integral to, to what I do. When I was an undergraduate, I was fortunate enough to be an undergraduate TA and for an anatomy course, and that's when I discovered like, wow, I'm good at this. Mm -hmm. And, and it, at, up to that point, I had never really known um, about myself what I was good at. Um, I always thought I wasn't good at anything. But I started teaching in that context in an anatomy lab, and I'm good at this. I like this. I really enjoy this. And so my students are um, really important to what I do, where I, I take an approach where it's um, kind of a, I, I lead them along, I lead them along the, the pathway where I want them to get to the point where, where I am in, in my career. And so I kind of do a, I guess a train the trainer sort of a model where I will work with my advanced graduate students who then will work with the students who are less advanced and who will work with the undergraduates. And, and I use that model when we're working on individual skeletal cases, 
But um, so I try to give my, my students a lot of responsibility so that they can learn how to be mentors themselves, they can learn how to be teachers themselves, they can learn how to do research. And um, in some of the, the research that I've done, my student, in fact, most of the research that I've done, my students are um, primary authors on presentations um, or um, articles that have come out um, of that work. I bring students with me to the field. I was just in Columbia over spring break for a week. I was able to bring one of my PhD students with me, which was super important um, to help, um, help her spread her wings and, and get her introduced to, to folks there. So, um, and then selfishly, I couldn't do my work without them. You know, I, I, there's, there's absolutely no way I can do what I do without, um, without my students' help. So yeah, they're, they're integral to, to what I do. I don't want to move away from our conversation without asking you specifically about your current program, research program in, in gunshot trauma analysis, because we mentioned that at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all related, but can you speak specifically to that? Yeah, so I, one of my areas of interest ha has been how do we improve the, the methods of analysis that we have when we're looking at the skeleton. So, you know, we look at the skeleton to try to figure out how old somebody was when they died, um, if they were male or female, and today there's new research trying to figure out if somebody was transgender or intersex. Is there a way we can see that on the skeleton? Um, how tall was somebody? Um, did they have diseases that affected their skeleton and so forth? And so my particular area of interest within that is when we have gunshot trauma, is there a way that we can say more about that gunshot trauma from looking at the bone rather than there's a gunshot wound and this is the entrance and this is the exit and this is the approximate amount of force that was used. Um, basically, that's, that's been our limit. That, that's as much as we've been able to say. And so um, in this project, what um, I was interested in looking at is, is there a way to look at the bone and be able to tell that bullets of differing construction were used? Because bullets are designed differently yeah. to do different things to the tissues that they impact. Can I look at the bone and can I tell that one type of construction was used versus another type of construction we, was we, used. Because you're not looking at the tissue. Right, I don't have soft tissue. Right. I don't, and, and that's one of the, that's certainly um, a detriment for us as, as um, skeletal biologists is that we don't have the soft tissue and the soft tissue records a lot more information than, than the bones do. But can, can the bone tell me something about, um, about bullet construction? Mm. And so that's, that's what I've been working on for the past, um, past couple of years. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Doctor. Absolutely. Thank you, Jamie. And up next, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Nicholas Gaspelin. He is an assistant professor of psychology. There he is. Hi, how are you? I am fabulous. I'm glad you're here. Dr. Gaspelin is an assistant professor of psychology. We're all going to love this because we're all going to learn something we need. <laughs> <laughs> he focuses on understanding how the brain processes information and focuses attention in a world of sensory overload. <laughs> right? Right? We saved this for last. Um, I, I've been peppering him with questions for two days now. Um, but first, I'm going to ask uh, the doctor, he said I can call him Nick, uh, about the photo that appears next to your bio. Not this photo, there's another photo. If you go to the website, there's a photo of the doctor holding something. Um, what are you holding in that photo and why? How does it relate to your work? I feel like I'm being picked on a little bit, like you found my picture in the school yearbook. But I'm, I'm holding a foam head, and on that foam head, there's a cap. And that cap is for an electroencephalogram, or an EEG machine. Um, and what we do in my lab is we put those caps on real human heads. <laughs> and there are electrodes that attach to that cap. And we can measure people's brain voltages or brain waves that are occurring real time while they perform different types of cognitive tasks. So we can, we can start to understand different things about brain processes that occur related to attention while people 
um, perform simple computer-based experiments. People volunteer for this. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it sounds, it's, it's completely non-invasive, so there's nothing, the electrodes are coated in plastic, and they kind of snap into this little cap. The only thing that's gross is that there's a little bit of gel that goes into it, but we, we reimburse our participants for the trouble. So. <laughs> so it's not painful? It's not painful painless. at all. Completely painless. Okay. Um, uh, well, I guess that gets us right to uh, the conversation we're going to have. This is the technology you're using to measure what the brain is doing when, when, when you give it whatever stimulus you want to give it. Yes, that, exactly. That's what we're going to talk about. Okay. So uh, then let me ask you some specific questions. Okay. All right. So you say you're studying how we're processing information in a world of sensory overload. So, so what is the sensory overload you're looking at? Are you talking about people standing on the grassy knoll and witnessing a presidential assassination, or kids, you know, who are you know caught up in a school shooting, or are you talking about regular people like us? who are going through their regular everyday lives but have to deal with the cell phone and the TV and the kids shouting and the dog barking, you know, just everyday sensory overload in regular life. Yeah, you've definitely nailed it with that last part. It's really okay. about everyday distraction in humans. I'm really interested in how uh, just cognition more generally, how people think about things. And I'm interested in what types of distractions in the real world could occur. You talked about cell phones, or a lot of us drive cars now that have little dashboard displays that are supposed to help us, but maybe they're actually distracting us from the task that we're supposed to be focusing on, which is operating our car <laughs> at the time. Right. Um, so I'm really interested in distraction in everyday humans, not necessarily clinical populations or any sort of special type of event. I'm just, mm -hmm. I think distraction is rampant. I think we live in an age of distraction, and I'm really interested in understanding the basic neuroscience underlying mm. distraction in humans. Which gets me to the same question I've asked your colleagues. Uh, did, did you anticipate how distracted we would be by this <laughs> current moment we're living in, or did you stumble into this work at just the best possible moment? Yeah, I think I just happened to walk into the right place at the right time. Um, when I was, no one really grows up thinking that they want to measure people's brain waves and study distraction. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a normal career choice. But it kind of gradually developed as I was in, I, I knew I was really interested in perception mm -hmm. um, and psychology. And then as an undergraduate, I realized that there were entire courses on perception. And I started to volunteer in a bunch of labs at the time that were studying perception. And around the end of the time that I was an undergrad, I became really interested in this idea about distraction. But at that point, cell phones still flipped open like this, and we weren't constantly glued to distractions mm -hmm. all around us. So there were no tablets at the mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like this really, really abstract thing. But as I was getting my PhD, it became very apparent that we were entering this kind of new point in society where mm. Technology is constantly vying for our uh, attention. And I, I failed to mention that just last year you received a career award from the National Science Foundation recognizing faculty who are talented young scholars and who've made a contribution to their fields early in their careers. And that is no doubt because of this work you're doing at this moment, because we are so distracted. Um, what kind of, when people are, are doing these experiments wearing these caps, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what are you, what kinds of tasks are you having them do to sort of mimic the distractions we're experiencing in our everyday lives? Yeah, yeah. So to study distraction in a laboratory setting, yeah. we have humans come in and we can do things like sometimes we place an EEG electrode cap on. We also have other fancy devices like infrared eye tracking cameras uh -huh. that can measure where people are looking in real time. But it's not just about what you're measuring in cognitive neuroscience, it's also about what people are doing. So a lot of cognitive neuroscience is really about the task. It's about measuring the thinking process that's underlying what, or some kind of performance type of variable. And so, and a lot of our 
in a lot of our experiments, we have human subjects come in, they sit in front of some sort of computer screen, and we have them perform some type of task that's kind of like a computer-based game, where they're usually looking for something, maybe like a simple type of shape, and they're trying to ignore something, maybe that's like a really bright flashing light, mm. or something that is uniquely colored, or something that's blinking, and we can start to measure things that occur over, for example, visual cortex okay. in the back of their head to try to infer where they're looking and what types of things are actually working to distract them and what types of processes are actually helping them ignore salient things. You know, so much of the research on distraction before I was involved in it was so focused on what happens when people aren't distracted that I think we also forgot about our inherent superpower, which is to avoid distraction. Mm. And that sometimes people get a kind of tunnel vision where they can completely block out distractions. And that can be good certain times in certain real world scenarios, like you don't want to be distracted by your cell phone while you're trying to read a book or something. But it can also be bad in certain real world settings. For example, there are a lot of bright, salient visual warning signals in the real world that fall outside of our immediate goals, but they're meant to warn us about something important, like watch out, this aisle has a floor that's wet. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, you need to stop at this four-way stop up ahead, and there's a stop sign that's supposed to automatically get you to orient to it. Mm -hmm. But we don't really have a lot of science understanding how effective these warning signals are. They're mostly being designed based upon intuition at mm. this point. You mentioned that people may not indeed really know where the exit signs are <laughs> in an emergency <laughs> right, yesterday right. when we were talking. Right, exactly. Yeah, uh, I, I think you may have a, a salient way to demonstrate what you're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Would it be fun for you guys to try to try one of these cognitive tasks? Yeah. All right. All right, so I think we can cue it up. I'm gonna kind of explain what it is that you should be doing beforehand. So in this task, this is what's called a capture probe paradigm. And I developed this when I was a postdoc at the University of California, Davis. And this is the kind of task that if you were someone who came in to volunteer for an experiment in my lab, I'd have you do, you do a lot of iterations of it. it probably you take you maybe like a, an hour to an hour and a half to complete it. But we're not gonna, don't worry, I'm not gonna keep you for an hour and a half. Okay, so in this task, what you're gonna do is you're gonna look for the green diamond. So you can see here on the top panel here, it's being pointed to as the target. And your job is to try to report the location of a dot inside that diamond as quickly as possible. And then we have our participants try to ignore some kind of salient distractor here you can see that it's this red, uniquely colored object that people call a color singleton in the field, and we have people try to ignore that. The trick in the probe task is that most of the trials are search trials. You're looking for something and trying to ignore something else, but on about 30% of trials, what's gonna happen is that the search shapes are gonna appear and letters are gonna appear really quickly on the screen, and then we have participants try to report as many letters as they saw. How quickly are the letters appearing? About a fifth of a second, so it's really hard to see them. I promise you'll be able to do it, lots of people have. And you'll probably only see about one or two letters, and we kind of use that report to get a snapshot of how you were distributing attention in the display at a time. If I talk about it like this, it sounds really abstract, but I think if you guys actually try it, it will actually work. So why don't we try a version of this task? We can go to the next slide. All right, so you're gonna look for the green diamond, and I want you to say aloud whether the dot inside of the green diamond is on the left or right-hand side. So you just say left or right. So this is, you're supposed to be loud while you do this. Sometimes letters are gonna flash on the screen. You don't have to do anything, anything about the dot on those types of trials. I just want you to see if you see any kinds of letters. All right, let's get ready to try. You guys ready? All right, that was actually pretty good. You're better than my undergrads are some days. All right, all right, let's, let's go. 
left. Left, very good. So you're reporting the location of the dot inside the diamond, and the diamond there is on the bottom one. Let's try another one. That one's probably a little bit harder because there's a distractor present in this display. Um, but you guys are doing good, pretty fast, <laughs> pretty quick. If you guys ever need or ever want to participate in a study, you know where to find me. All right, let's try one more. <laughs> Did anyone see any letters? You can blurt them out. X, Y, you, you, E. That's not fair. <laughs> H. All right. Did anyone see like four or five letters that they feel comfortable reporting? Probably not. Don't worry. That's normal. All right. I once had a guy who could report all six letters each time, and I'm convinced he was some kind of like superhuman that we should be studying. Okay. Let's actually show the, the letters that were appeared, that appeared on the screen. So if you were someone who reported an E, good job. You had like shifted to the diamond and were attending that already. If you reported the C, I'm sorry to report, but you were distracted on that <laughs> trial. It's okay. It was kind of a trick that I played. Um, and if you reported anything else, you were getting another letter in the display that wasn't really the target or the distractor. So we use these kinds of games to study how people attend in different kinds of tasks, and we can actually measure different things like brain waves and eye movements to try to understand other parts of distraction and cognition. It's fun. It is fun. We didn't play because we'd seen the test the day before. <laughs> that wouldn't have been fair. All right, we have time for some questions. I think there's a microphone somewhere, but in the meantime, I don't know what's happening with the microphone. For those who may want to ask their questions aloud, I do have some questions that came in on this distracting pad that I'm holding. <laughs> uh, and this first one, I believe is for Dr. DeGange. Uh, how are you able, but I think anyone can answer it. How are you able to bring your individual research and experience and travels into the classroom at Binghamton? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic idea. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, really important to me to, to incorporate students in, in my research. But the way that I, that I bring that into the classroom is I, as I weave in the, the kinds of things that I've done um, in Colombia and other countries, um, and, and some of my work that I do here in the United States, I weave that into, um, into my lectures. I weave it into um, the lab activities that, that we do. And so um, this semester, for example, I'm teaching a methods and forensic anthropology course. And I have the course flipped. So the students watch my recorded lectures at home. In class, we go over the labs and we talk about their findings um, on, on the lab activities that they did on their own time. And so as we're going over those labs, I talk about, well, when I'm in the field, you know, this, this is how I would apply this particular method, or you know, this is how I would interpret this particular finding. And so that's how I try to, to weave it all together for them. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to toss this one from Sandra Griffiths. I don't know where you are. Thank you for the question. Uh, to you, Dr. Brooks, because we haven't heard from you in a bit. Can you share what it is like when one of your students has an aha moment or experience and how that changes their experience in the classroom or in the laboratory? Absolutely. And, and I'm not normally the quiet person, so it's interesting you haven't heard from me in a while. Um, it's, in the laboratory especially, I think, is when that happens. So bench science is a lot of repetition. It takes a long time. You fail a lot. Um, I often tell the students, I'll make the mistakes just so you feel better about when you make it, but really I'm just making mistakes. And I had one student who graduated pharmacy school last year who was in my laboratory for a while who was trying to do a fairly, a fairly complicated task, but it took him about a year and it was over and over in different ways and we'd tweak it. And I remember when he got it to work, my technician had actually reported to him that he got it to work. I was teaching in the class when he was told that he got it to work, and all of a sudden he stopped class to tell me that you know, the Western blot showed the protein. He was just so excited in class that this thing worked that we disrupted our oncology class to learn that he found a protein. And it was just, you know, his, he's not the type of person to be disappointed by anything. He's actually a very resilient, amazing person. 
but he, he had this renewed interest in what he was doing in the lab, and he was so excited he had to blurt it out in oncology class. But he found a protein, it was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it does renew your excitement, I imagine, as well. I, I enjoy it. We learn from mistakes at almost every level, and sometimes most of our fascinating experiences and our, our most brilliant um, things that we discover are actually things we did wrong in the first place. Mm. And so it's really important to, to get students to be okay with making mistakes and to realize that we're okay doing it as well. And so I, I constantly, I, I do, I make mistakes all the time. I'm human. I, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I felt like when you were describing the household with all the distractions, I wanted to know if you had a camera in my house with all of those things going on. Um, <laughs> you could study me very easily. Uh, in fact, I'm distracted right now. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I find just the process of science and how we learn is just fascinating. And I, I love what we do every day, even when things aren't working or you mess it up. It's just, I, I love what we do. I get to kill cancer on, on a daily basis, mm. in a test tube, mm -hmm. in, on a bench. <laughs> uh, it does remind me, uh, Nick, to ask you the same question I asked your colleagues about student involvement. You implied it, um, given the work you're doing, but can you just speak a little more to that? Yeah, yeah. Students are really, really important to the mission of my lab, and they really contribute a lot to my scientific research. They contribute in a few ways. Firstly, a lot of the people who participate in the experiments are students from the university who are volunteering or being compensated monetarily to do that. Um, and they really, really enjoy the opportunity to see electrodes get put on or see their own brain waves and that kind of stuff. But we also have a lot of undergraduates who work in our laboratory because to run human subject research, it takes a lot of time. Each one of these sessions takes like an hour. So we've trained a kind of army of undergraduates who can come in and they know how to do things like attach EG electrodes to someone, or they know how to operate an eye tracking uh, machine. So um, a, lot of, a lot of our research really does involve undergraduates quite a bit, and that's actually how I got started in this, is that I was at a university, I started volunteering in some labs. I didn't even fully realize, I think, what I was doing when I first started volunteering in those labs, and then gradually, by just getting experience and like getting hands-on experience, I became just kind of fascinated with it. So my hope is that we instill that same kind of experience in students here. We've had a couple of our students actually continue on to PhD programs. We fabulous. had someone go to Ohio State this year for a PhD. Oh, that's fabulous. Uh, so I promised that we would finish this program right at noon so that we could move on to the lunch the important lunch program, lunch. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to, to ask this question that came from the audience to each of you to close us out. Uh, and I guess we'll go in reverse order. So it, Nick, why don't you start us off, but each of you can answer the question, how are, you, uh, how are you hoping, or how do you hope, your field will evolve over the next five years? I imagine we're gonna get three very different <laughs> and exciting answers given that we're hearing from three very different fields. Yeah, Doctor? I, I, my hope is that there have been a lot of strong debates in my field about really, really simple things and I feel like there have been some, um, we need, what's basically coming up is that we need new ways of measuring attention and I think a lot of the old tricks of just measuring how quickly someone presses a button or something like that, they've been being used over and over again since the 1970s and the 1980s. So I'm hoping just to see people develop new tasks and then take that knowledge that we're learning and start to apply it to real things rather than just studying it in a laboratory setting like the types of experiments that you guys were seeing today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see them applied to real world scenarios like oh. cell phone devices and things like that. So that's what I'm hoping to see over the next five years. Taking it into the real world. Definitely, from the lab to the real world. I think there's so much opportunity to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't always work out that way in basic science that things move from basic science to the real world. I think it's important, science is important, it has real impacts on people's life. Thank you for that, Dr. DeGangi. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful question, really relevant to um, some of the stuff I'm starting to write right now. 
um, for, for my colleagues in forensic anthropology. Traditionally, forensic anthropologists have been uh, technicians, and that's been a critique that my colleagues in other areas of anthropology have had about those of us who do forensics, that we are osteological technicians where we analyze a skeleton, write a report, hand it off to law enforcement, and are in general ignorant of the social forces that led to a fact, led to the fact that there was a skeleton in the woods or a mm -hmm. skeleton in a mass grave to begin with right. that we needed to, to analyze. And um, I would like to see forensic anthropology start to incorporate some of the things that we know from other areas of anthropology. I would like to see us be anthropologists, as I say it with a capital A, where we are incorporating um, social theory into uh, the fact, not only that we are doing these, these um, analyses, but that we are thinking about some of those broader social issues that are important to why somebody became a skeleton um, in, in the first place. And so um, I recently wrote a paper about how can we be anti-racist in our practice of mm -hmm. forensic anthropology. Um, and so that, that's where I would like to see us going in, in the next five years. And I, and I do see us going there. My students and students in general in the field have, have really taken up that call in, in force. So I'm really excited to see um, where, where we wind up five, 10 years from now. Thank you. Yeah. And Dr. Brooks. So when chemotherapy was first developed for cancer, it was really toxic, killed anything that grew, and, and it was almost a race between the cancer and the patient. And those, those drugs still exist. They are still the mainstay of most therapies. Um, but we've moved more into a molecular age where we realize that, A, not all cancer is the same. There's over 200 different types of cancer. Um, and I can just take breast cancer, for example. There's, there's four major types. And there's all the genetics and the different things and the different proteins that get expressed. And so by moving from just kill anything that grows into an area where we can target, hey, you have this protein that doesn't exist anywhere else in the body, let's focus on that and make the cancer therapy better. That's already happening to some degree, but you know, taking actually to follow off you, the individuality, the, the racial features, the genetic background, all sorts of different even life experiences and exposures and understand how those molecular changes can be exploited in new therapies and really get away from the toxic stuff to much more uh, a higher efficacy, much more targeted on the cancer for each individual patient um, is really where the field is moving. And, and I think we're going to see large expansions in this area in the next five to 10 years. Well, it was an excellent question, I think whichever member of the audience sent it in. And that means that in five years, we can gather again on this stage and we can talk about what has come to pass and your important work. And I thank you all. I want you to join me, please, in thanking Dr. Tracy Brooks, Dr. Elizabeth DeGange, and Dr. Nicholas Gasplin for joining us today. And for their work, for their work.